Okay, let's continue with uh, analysis of variance. We figured out how this works in principle, and uh, we actually ended up with an ANOVA table in R that gave us all kinds of interesting uh, information. So we're going to go over this in a little bit more detail, what the F statistic is, what those two types of degrees of freedom are, and what else is in this ANOVA table. So there were mean squares and sum of squares, and we figured out what they are and what they're good for. Okay, so let's uh, think a moment about our F statistic. So we said it's a signal to noise ratio, it's a variance between divided by variance uh, within treatments. And let's assume for a moment that we have actually no treatment effect. So we are basically sampling three times from the same population. What would you expect our F value to be, right? Um, so it would be a one to one. Um, so we would get a one here if I were to plot my F values out uh, for a sample. But probably I'm not exactly going to get one because it's a sampling procedure, right? So my sample means will not exactly be the same. So they vary a bit and sometimes they vary more than other times. So sometimes I might get an F value that's a, that's a bit larger or a bit smaller. And if I'm really lucky or unlucky, uh, depending on how you look at it, um, I, might, I might get an exceptionally high uh, variance between or a low variance uh, between, right? So those, those variances will jump around a bit. So if you think about how that translates to distribution, so if I divide by ever bigger number, or if I have a small number divided by a big number, that approaches zero, right? So it never quite reaches zero but uh, it's bound by uh, the zero value. If my variances between are large relative to the variances within, and, and this is just random variation, right? Then I get ever bigger values, and uh, the probability that this would happen by random chance would, would decrease uh, rapidly. So uh, this probability approaches zero, but it's possible, right? So if you do it often enough, uh, you might get a really big a signal to noise ratios just by random chance. So this is my distribution. And um, what I can do now, uh, if I'm asking, you know, could this difference that I observe here, could the signal to noise ratio just arise uh, due to random chance, I can just integrate the area under the curve and I have my answer, right? And uh, this is what the P, PF and QF functions do. So instead of uh, PT and QT, uh, that we had for the t-test, uh, we have the same functionality for pf and qf. So if I have calculated a signal-to-noise ratio, I can calculate what's the probability of getting a, a bigger value just by random chance, and one minus that, uh, that's the p-value, so that's a probability that I'm wrong about my statement that there is a difference among those means. So I can also do it the other way around, although that's not that important here because there are no confidence intervals to calculate here. So this is purely uh, working with a preset alpha level to reject the null hypothesis. So I could um, uh, say I set an alpha level at 0 0.05, then my percentile here would be the 95th percentile, and then I can calculate a critical F value. So if I manually calculate my F value, then I can use that to reject my null hypothesis. But this really only has a historical use, so this is for, for uh, situations where people looked up p-values in uh, textbooks and then did manual f-value calculations. So we don't do this anymore. You, will, you would always report the p-value itself. So you would never say that the variety treatment is significant at an alpha level of 0.5. No, you would actually report the p-value. So there's a lot more information there, so people can set their own alpha level if they want. Okay, and uh, now uh, the explanation that I'm still owing here is the degrees of freedom. Uh, just like the T distribution, the F distribution also slightly changes shape, and this has to be accounted for. So this depends on how many treatments you have and how many samples you have. So there are degrees of freedom for the variance between and the variance within, and we can quickly figure that out actually, because we have it here. So for the variance between, I do have one statistic here in my calculation. So I have to calculate the overall mean. I'm treating those individual means here actually as observations, right? But I need that overall experimental mean in order to calculate that variance uh, of the sample means. So the degree of freedom here is n minus 1. But the n is actually the number of treatments. So it's actually t minus 1, if you call the number of treatments t. Uh, which you usually do by convention. And 
Then for the pooled variance within, we have a total number of samples, uh, which is 4 times 3 varieties is 12. But then in each of those variance calculations for those individual sample variances, there is a mean in there too, right? So I need the mean of variety C to calculate the sample variance. So in this case, it's n minus t. So the total number of samples minus the number of treatments. And so that's what those degree of freedoms are. So this is t minus 1, and this is n minus t. So n being the total number of samples, and t being the number of treatments. OK, and then um, let's also check out the ANOVA table that uh, R gave us. Um, so the way this is structured is that I list my effects. So in this case, I only have one, uh, my variety treatment. But there can be more, right? Uh, so another, if we have multi-factor ANOVAs, the next thing that we'll introduce is the farm location. Um, so there can be multiple rows here. So I list my degree of freedom, which is the number of treatment levels minus one. So I have uh, variety A, B, and C, that's 3 minus 1. And my error term, that's my variance within, uh, so that's a residual error that I can't explain. That had a degree of freedom of N minus T, so the total number of sample minus the number of treatment levels. And then what's called mean squares. So mean squares is just another word for the variances. So I have my variance between and my variance within here. And um, it also gives the sum of squares. So this is without dividing by the uh, degrees of freedom. So if we look this up here at the top, uh, these are my sum of squares. This is my sum of squares, and then I divide by the degrees of freedom. So this is simply what, what is reported here in that uh, NOVA table. So I get both the sum of squares uh, uh, and then the sum of squares divided by degree of freedom. And then to get my p-value, I have to use my pf function, so integrate the area under the curve, variance between divided by variance within, uh, with the correct degrees of freedom here. Remember, this this actually gave me a 99th point nine percentile, so it was on the it's always on the right end of that uh, distribution. So it's one minus p. So it's a probability of getting a larger f value by random chance alone. So it's beautiful that uh, R uses this abbreviation because this is really uh, what that p value also means. That's nice. So maybe uh, you might be wondering why uh, you know even bother to report the sum of squares. That seems kind of redundant. You know I can calculate it if I want to, and what's the point, right? But the sums of squares are actually also useful and interesting, and um, uh, they they kind of give you a sense of how much variation in your experiment or in your sampling design is due to any particular effect. So in our case, this is not very interesting, but if you have bigger designs with uh, many treatment levels, often you're actually not that interested in whether one variety is different from another statistically. You're more interested in the variance component. So what proportion of the overall variance that I observe um, can be explained by a variety or maybe soil types or some other factor? So if you think what the sum of squares really are, uh, that's part of that variance calculation, right? So I'm taking the difference between the mean and the uh, observation. So I'm talking about uh, the actual lentil plants here, what I measure in my trial. And then I calculate the difference between the overall mean and that individual, and I square it to get rid of the negative value. So it's a, it's a metric of how variable uh, things are. And um, if I can say, this portion of my overall variance that I observe there in the field is due to genetic effects and another and another component is due to soils. Uh, that is also interesting and actionable information. So those summer squares is actually what supercharged the agricultural revolution after Fisher, right? So you could figure out how much of my variation is due to genotype and how much is due to environment, right? Uh, so if, if it's mostly uh, environmental effects and not genetic effects, I might as well not waste my time with trying to select uh, superior genotypes because I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, so there has to be a genetic variance in order for selection and breeding to work. So that insight and that math that caused the green revolution. And um, you know, that's also applicable in other fields. So 
as soon as you have treatments with many levels, so for example, if you have a bunch of different soil types in a sampling design, or you're sampling a large area with, with a set of different regions, or if you are looking at different ecosystem classifications. So these are all class variables that might contribute to variance observed in whatever you're measuring. Um, so in those cases, uh, the p-value in your table is, is not that exciting and not that interesting. So oftentimes you do want to look at the sum of squares. Uh, so this, this is what can be interesting. There's actually even a variant of this analysis of variance where you don't even bother to calculate p-values or estimate means. So that's called a random effects model where you're exclusively focusing on estimating those variance components. So we'll cover this later. We'll talk about random effects, fixed effects, and mixed models briefly, um, just so you know what they are. But for most practical intents and purposes in environmental management, you can just use those sum of squares here to estimate your variance components, and this will give you good information. Good. And uh, just to be sure that uh, what I told you here is uh, actually correct, let's go back to R and uh, check the numbers. So let's start with our signal to noise ratio here. That is 92.9. So that is this value here. Then we already established that this one is correct, but I just run it again anyway. So that is my p-value, which we can find here. And then let's check what the signal is. So that's my variance between. That's 62,000. There it is. Let's check our noise. That's 672 uh, right here. Very nice. And now let's multiply this by the degrees of freedom to get our sum of squares. And sure enough, that's my sum of squares. And my noise, that's my sum of squares for my residual or error or noise. So let's also calculate the proportion of the variance that's uh, due to a variety, although in this particular case, so if you're actually controlling the treatment, you are usually interested in whether that is a significant effect. But let's just um, uh, calculate it anyway, what the variance component would be here. So I take that variety sum of square and divide by the total variance, which is this plus the noise and we get 95%. So 95% of my total observed variance is due to those genotypes. So that can be important information. Uh, so there you have it. Analysis of variance is done. And you'll see how quickly things come together now. So now once you understand one statistical test, you understand them all. And everything should make sense and fall into place. There are no mysteries here. That's pretty good stuff.